I'm glad some people have remembered it's a two o'clock st start. Uh, next item of business is portfolio questions. I move to the first question uh, on communities and local government. Brian Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the impact on local authorities' autonomy on increases in ring-fenced funding. Cabinet Secretary. Local authorities have complete autonomy to allocate over 92% or 10.3 billion of the total funding provided by the Scottish Government plus all their locally raised income. They can allocate this on the basis of local needs and priorities, having first fulfilled their statutory obligations and the jointly agreed set of national and local priorities. It's important to note that ring-fenced funding is money for increased investment in services such as in our schools, nurseries and our town centres. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Um, whilst the percentage of the budget that is ring-fenced has gone up, uh, core general revenue funding has gone down across the country, which has squeezed council budgets that need that money to carry out the everyday services of the council. Does the Minister recognise that reducing core funding has a negative impact on the council's ability to provide and maintain sport and leisure facilities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we um, have uh, worked with local authorities and have increased their... Uh, funding a proportion, proportion of funding that they get but I think it's also important to recognise that we've worked hard to provide them provide local authorities with a fair settlement uh, and just remind Brian Whittle just what might have been the consequences if we'd followed his party's tax plans the potential 500 million pound less uh, going towards local authorities that could have meant a uh, 14.9 million less for Dumfries and Galloway a uh, 11.4 million pounds less for East Ayrshire a uh, South Ayrshire 10.5 million pound less and what that would have meant for sport uh, and leisure facilities we'll continue to work and support local authorities, the work they do, and I know that my colleague Joe Fitzpatrick will always prioritise uh, ensuring that we get our nation active. Richard Lyle, briefly. Can the uh, Cabinet Secretary confirm that the overall additional funding in 2019-20 will amount to over £600 million? Isn't it the case that this 3.8% real-term funding increase empowers local authorities to decide how to improve lives in local communities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely. I can confirm that taken together with council tax income, local authorities will have access to over £600 million additional total funding this year. And that is real funding to deliver services that will benefit local communities the length and breadth of Scotland. And we, as a Scottish Government, will continue to work with our partners uh, in local government to make sure that we can uh, continue to provide a fair settlement and recognise the good work that our colleagues across local government does. Alec Rowley. Well, as Cosler have pointed out time and time again, there was £400 million in new commitments built into the budget this year. The Finance Secretary said that the councils would have to deprioritise. This morning, Presiding Officer in the Dunfermline Press, it was reported that Fife Council do not have the resources to properly look at uh, the standards of food premises. And it was clear that Question, they, said, they said in staffing and budget cuts is responsible. Do you accept that right across Scotland and communities, local services are being cut? And should we not be honest with the public? Mr Rowley, that was a long supplementary cabinet secretary. I um, uh, will be honest in this parliamentary chamber and remind uh, the member that the local authorities have the autonomy, autonomy to allocate over 92% of the budget provided to them by the Scottish Government. I've already confirmed to Richard Lyle that also uh, they have, uh, an, uh, they can, taken together with council tax reform, local authorities will have access to over £600 million additional total funding uh, this year. Now, we're not pretending that it's not a challenge for all of public life uh, to cope with the financial challenges that we face. But nevertheless, we have provided funding for local authorities, a fair settlement, increased funding, as I've outlined to Richard uh, Lyle. And we will continue to work with local government uh, to uh, deliver on the outcomes, the shared outcomes, the national priorities, and enable them to take the action that they need to do with their own local priorities as they set their own budgets. Question two, Stuart McMillan. We are signing also to ask the Scottish Government how much has been invested in social housing in the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency since May 2011. Minister. Uh, presiding officer, between May 2011 and March 2018, uh, the Scottish Government invested over £40 million to deliver more social housing in the Greenock and Inverclyde local authority area. This investment has supported the completion of 829 homes for social rent in communities across Inverclyde. 
This level of investment means that Inverclyde will make a significant contribution to the delivery of the 50,000 affordable homes target and to meeting the housing demand across the Inverclyde area. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply and I very much welcome this investment and, uh, and I welcome much of the Inverclyde local development plan which proposes a number of locations to be zoned for social housing. However, does the Minister agree with me that Inverclyde Council should be cautious in their approach and have greater concerns about public safety where and there is the potential for either a over provision but also concerns for people's safety as is the situation that's proposed for Kern Drive in Gurukh. Minister. Uh, President officer, Scottish planning policy is very clear uh, that the impacts of development of, on traffic and road safety uh, should be taken into account in plans and decisions. Um, I cannot comment further on sites in the Inverclyde uh, area uh, because I'm expecting their local development plan uh, to come before me very, very shortly. Question three, John Mason. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on introducing five-yearly electrical safety checks for homes in the social rented sector. Minister. Presiding officer, social landlords are required to ensure that electrical, electrical installations are safe to use in the homes that they let. The frequency that electrical safety checks should be carried out is not prescribed, but landlords should take account of the guidance in the BS 7671 wiring regulations, which recommends that a competent person should inspect and test electrical installations in rented housing at intervals of no more than five years. John Mason. It, it does seem strange, I thank the Minister for his answer, but it does seem strange that there, there is a stricter regime for the private landlords who have to inspect every five years, and yet we understand that quite a number of housing associations only inspect every 10 years. Minister. Um, President officer, everyone deserves to be able to live in a safe home uh, that is protected from fire. Uh, when this uh, parliament introduced a specific duty uh, for five yearly checks in the private rented sector, uh, we did so in response to evidence that private tenants were considered to be particularly at risk. However, I agree with the principle uh, that the same level of protection should apply to all rented housing, uh, and I'm happy to confirm that this point will be considered uh, when the guidance on the Scottish Housing Quality Standard is reviewed. Question for Bill Bowman. Ask the Scottish Government what policies have been put in place to tackle the reported rise in relative poverty in Scotland's communities. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Key policies such as Fair Start Scotland, our expansion of funded early learning and childcare, and investment in devolved social security measures are all, are all co contributing to tackling poverty and inequality and making Scotland a fairer and more prosperous country. In addition, we have outlined a range of concrete and ambitious actions in our Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, backed by a £50 million fund. Poverty levels continue to be impacted by the UK Government welfare cuts, which are estimated to reduce social security spending in Scotland by £3.7 billion by 2020-21. And this is why we also invest an annual £125 million in mitigation. Bill Bowman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Dundee in 2017-18 overspent its share of the Scottish Welfare Fund by more than £104,000. Dundee Council paid for that overspend from its own pocket. Despite the clear need to support those living in deprivation, the Scottish Government has cut its 2018-19 allocation of the Scottish Welfare Fund to Dundee by £100,000. Will the Cabinet Secretary explain to the Chamber why this SNP Government is taking such a callous approach to tackling relative poverty in Dundee? And will she commit to ensure communities such as Thank mine you. receive their fair share? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think Bill Bowman has a bit of a brass neck coming yeah, to this yeah. chamber uh, demanding that we further mitigate the devastating impacts that his government and the decisions, the politically motivated, ideologically driven decisions that his party have taken at Westminster, yeah. which have taken and will remove £3.7 billion out of social security spending by 2020-21. He has to concede that that will have a devastating impact in the people's lives most vulnerable across the country and also in Dundee. And again, like my point I made to Brian Whittle, his tax plans, the Tory tax plans that would have taken £500 million out of uh, the budget and public spending, yeah. would have meant for Dundee less 
£13.9 million for spending on services in his uh, city that he was talking about. I think for him, he needs to take a wee bit of a closer look at home about where the problem and where poverty uh, and the cause of poverty lies. And it's with his party and his UK government. Yeah. Two brief supplementaries, Elaine Smith, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that unclaimed welfare benefits are a key cause of financial hardship? And in particular, the point that Age Scotland highlight that the DWP estimate that 40% of couples eligible for pension credit are not claiming it and the upcoming pension credit changes on May 15th could cost mixed stage couples up to £7,000 a year. And I appreciate that's the Conservatives, but can I ask why the Scottish Government is not giving priority to ensuring that there's a maximum uptake in Scotland before the switch to universal credit for mixed stage couples? Cabinet Secretary, please, and also briefly. I, I would point uh, to uh, the financial health check service that we are funding, which is delivered through Citizens uh, Advice Scotland across Bureau across the, the country, a free telephone number as well for people who can access the support and help to make sure that they are claiming all that they are entitled to. Uh, uh, that free phone number is available to constituents that uh, Elaine Smith has that require that additional support and help. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline whether or not the Scottish Government would be better equipped to tackle relative poverty in Scotland if it followed Tory spending plans that would see half a billion pound less being available this year to invest in public services? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. And I totally agree with uh, Kenny Gibson's point. We would not be better equipped if we'd followed the Conservative Council uh, co uh, tax plans in this uh, chamber. Abs, you have highlighted implementing those income tax plans alone is forecast to leave the 2019-20 budget over £500 million worse off. Uh, and I can reveal to uh, Kenny Gibson that that would have meant for his constituents less £13.3 million to spend uh, on services. So again, the Conservatives need to look a wee bit closer to home about where the problems and inequality, uh, the causes of that, where that lies, and that is again with their decisions. Yeah. Question five, Angela Constant. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its response to the report on food poverty, dignity, ending hunger together in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, at the heart of our approach to food insecurity are the group's dignity principles that underpin our Fair Food Fund, which we have increased from 1.5 million to 3.5 million this year. The fund supports dignified and rights-based responses to food insecurity, helping tackle the causes of poverty. No one should be left hungry and have to rely on charitable food provision in a country as prosperous as Scotland. Everyone has a right to food. And it's shameful that UK government welfare cuts continue to force people into poverty and food insecurity, though we are mitigating the very worst effects and spent £125 million last year alone. Angela Constance. Thank you. Given that the West Lothian Food Bank reports a 40% increase in demand since the rollout of universal credit, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that we will not be a rich society until no man, woman or child has to rely on food banks? And will she therefore support calls by Nourish Scotland, the Scottish Food Coalition and the 1400 respondents to the Good Food Nation Bill consultation to incorporate the right to food in Scots law? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I agree that no one should have to rely on charity to eat in a nation as rich as Scotland's and that's why a rights-based approach already runs through the action we're taking and we're challenging the UK government welfare reforms, mitigating their impact and investing in dignified responses through our three and a half million fair food fund. And we're certainly very grateful to the respondents to the Good Food Nation consultation which recently closed and we'll look at how we may give better effect to a rights-based approach in practice. And the National Task Force that the First Minister committed to setting up following the recommendations of her advisory group on human rights leadership will be considering all internationally recognised human rights, including the right to food. Question six, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will initiate cross-party discussions regarding agent of change in advance of stage three of the Planning Scotland Bill. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of ensuring that new development does not adversely impact existing businesses, particularly music venues. Uh, I welcome the support for this view from others right across this chamber. I am happy to discuss the agent of change principle with Mr MacDonald, as I've already done with others, to make sure that we get this right for stage three. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, and I'm grateful to the Minister. I know he acknowledges that the current planning system does not provide adequate protection for live music venues, but I recall from discussion at the committee that he does not wholly support the approach currently envisaged in the Planning Scotland Bill. Can he indicate 
what approach the government intends to take when the bill is considered at stage three. Minister. Um, President officer, I'm fully committed uh, to the agent of change principle. Uh, and that's been shown by the circular that went out from the chief planner uh, in recent times before we even considered uh, this legislation. And I've said uh, right throughout that we will look at this very closely indeed, and in particular look at it again when it comes to National Planning Framework 4. Um, the provision um, of culturally, culturally significant zones, uh, which, which was added at stage two, uh, while no doubt well-intentioned, uh, would have some serious adverse consequences, which I spelt out during stage two. Uh, they would place a range of duties and burdens on our planning authorities and in the development sector with a hefty, very hefty price tag that could both affect the viability of investment in development we need and thwart our ambitions to reinvigorate our high streets. So we have got to get this right and we've got to strike the right balance. And that's why I've been pleased uh, to talk to a number of MSPs already uh, around about how we reshape this uh, when it comes to stage three. Uh, and I'm more than happy to have similar discussions with Mr. MacDonald. Very briefly, please, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Um, would, would the minister agree with me that cross-party talks have, uh, very positive cross-party talks have been going on for some time on the planning bill uh, and that these will continue, and if Mr. MacDonald had spoken to his colleague, Mr. Rowley, he would know that. Minister. I'm very pleased that folks have been engaging uh, with me um, from all of the parties uh, in the chamber on this issue. And I'm very happy to talk to party representatives, but also to individuals who may have concerns. My door in this regard is always open. Uh, we have got to make sure uh, that we get stage three of this planning bill absolutely right. Uh, and I'm sure that we can do that together with cooperation. Question seven, Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it next ex expects to publish a local government finance circular. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government publishes local government finance circulars whenever there is a requirement to pro provide local government with new or updated information. Although there are set occasions when circulars are issued, there are no set dates. To date, in 2019, the Scottish Government has issued four local government finance circulars accounting for equal pay, the approved 2019-20 local government finance settlement, non-domestic rates interest for 2019-20 and capital receipts to fund transformational projects. All local government finance circulars are published on the Scottish Government website. Briefly, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for the answer. Recent figures show North East Councils make up four of the ten least funded per head local authorities in Scotland. That is a massive inequality in funding for core services. North East uh, school children and pensioners receive significantly less per head than elsewhere. So can the Cabinet Secretary justify why do North East Councils not receive their fair share of funding? And tell the North people of the North thank East, you. when can they expect a fair and deal thank from you. the SNP? Cabinet Secretary. A local authority funded is allocated using a needs-based formula which is kept under constant review and agreed on each year with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. And since the introduction of the 85% funding flow in 2012, Aberdeen City Council has been allocated more than 50 million over and above their needs-based formula funding allocations. Again, though, perhaps Liam Kerr did not hear the, the points that I made to Brian Whittle and to his colleague Bill Bowman, yeah. if we had followed his tar party's tax plans at the budget, then I can reveal to him that Aberdeen City Council would have been less 17.6 million because you would have taken 500 yeah. million yeah. out of our yeah. budget. Aberdeenshire, 24.2 million pounds. So again, I plead to Liam Kerr, look a wee bit closer to home about where some of the funding challenges may have lied if we'd followed okay, your plans. Yeah. And again, if he's concerned about the people of Aberdeenshire and the North East, then look to his own party and their damaging welfare changes. Yeah. That they have Thank you, made. Cabinet Secretary. I'll get Mr Harvey in. Question eight, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government further to its commitment to in its response to the Equalities and Human Rights Commission report, Head and Lives New Beginnings, by what date it will publish its anti-destitution strategy? This must be brief, Cabinet Secretary. Okay, the Scottish Government committed to work with stakeholders to take forward the development of an anti-destitution strategy focused on people with no recourse to public funds. We also committed to consider some of the committee's other recommendations as part of that work. In February, as a first step, the Government and COSLA launched updated guidance on no recourse to public funds, and we expect to publish the anti-destitution strategy by the end of the year. Patrick Harvey. 
I, I would make the case for as much acceleration of this work as possible. The anti-destitution strategy is necessary because of the actions of the, the likes of CERCO, who the Minister will be aware are this week again reported to be issuing eviction notices to some of the most vulnerable asylum seekers uh, in their accommodation, people who have literally nowhere else to go. This will create another wave of destitution. Can the Minister tell us whether CERCO consulted the Scottish Government before taking this new action and will she write to or contact CERCO immediately to insist that this action be stopped uh, in, in the, in the wake on. in Come the on. fact that there is no alternative destitution provision for these vulnerable people? Cabinet Secretary. I'll certainly look into that and I'm aware, I'm aware also that there's an appeal being lodged by today by Govan uh, Law Centre and I absolutely uh, concur around the uh, really dismal practice of, of changing locks for people who are then enforced into destitution. That's why we continue also to raise these issues with the Home uh, Secretary, uh, making the point again that there needs to be a far better way in which we prepare and, and support uh, people uh, in the asylum process and do not have a system that enforces people into destitution and enforces them into homelessness. Uh, so I'll uh, look into this issue further, uh, make any representations that we need to, and again make the point to the Home uh, Secretary that this needs to be sorted and sorted quickly. Uh, thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. I beg your pardon. Point of order. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I want to ask whether or not the Cabinet Secretary, under the, the rules and procedures and standing orders, might want to amend the record because, in answer to question five, the Cabinet Secretary said, and I quote, everyone has a right to food. However, the Government Good Food Nation Bill consultation explicitly ruled out implementing a right Can to I food. Can I stop you right there because what you've said is not a point of order. I don't want to take time out of the next stage three debate. There is a process for correcting the record. I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary has heard what you have to say, but it is not a point of order. Please sit down. Um, I'm moving on to the next item of business.